Hello, good day, nice to meet you. My name is Paloma Aragones. I'm a traumatologist and professor of anatomy in the medicine degree at the Complutense University. And I also work as an aesthetic doctor at COS Clinic. Today, I'm going to give a class on facial anatomy. It's a super important class. Let's try to lay the foundations of anatomy so that you are able to decide the best treatments for your patients, depending on a series of aesthetic canons and also have the least possible complications. I will try to make it as pleasant as possible, although anatomy is pretty tough. I'll try to give it a clinical application to make it more interesting. I'm going to follow this index. Let's do a short introduction at the beginning. We are going to see concepts of surface anatomy, which are very important in the nomenclature. Concepts of facial beauty that are currently considered in aesthetic medicine. And then we're going to get into serious anatomy, bone anatomy, head muscles, ligaments, fat compartments, and finally, vessels and nerves. First of all, I would like to emphasize this a lot. It's very important because we're going to work on the face and we're going to constantly talk about planes. This is a little different from what you studied in undergraduate anatomy. And those of you who have continued to have contact with anatomy during your residence, this has nothing to do with it. So, why do I say that it's important? Because depending on the treatment we want to do, we will have to work on some planes or others. And what planes are these? From superficial to deep, we're going to have the skin in the foreground, which we have in this diagram. Then, we have the subcutaneous fat, and immediately deeper, we're going to have the superficial fascia, also known as the SMAS system. Next, we have the deep fascia, followed by the mimic muscles. And finally, a layer of deep fat closely related to the periosteum of the bone. What is the SMAS? It is the superficial musculoaponeurotic system. It is just under the skin and is formed by collagen, elastin, fibromuscular cells, and adipocytes. And it will be present in all the tissue of the face and also in the body. Let's get into surface anatomy. As I told you, before getting into the anatomy of bone and muscles, we will first identify the regions that we have on our face. Because when we do clinical histories, it's very important that we all use a common nomenclature. To do this, we will divide the head into various regions. An area that is the skull cap or cranial vault, and another that is the facial massif. The cranial vault consists of a temporal region, a parietal region, and an occipital region. This is very simple. The facial massive is a bit more complicated, but read the names and they will sound familiar to all of you. The frontal region, the nasal region, orbital, infraorbital, zygomatic on the sides of the orbital. We have an oral region and a buccal region that surround the mouth, a parotid region, just inferior to both pavilions, and then a mental region marked by number 11. When the subject is looking up, we will see that we have a submental region and on both sides the submandibular. If we focus on the orbital region, we enlarge the image a little and we see that within the eye or orbital region, we have several areas. A supraorbital zone, which is above the upper eyelid, and an infraorbital zone that is under the lower eyelid. And we have two very important grooves which we are going to hear about continuously in aesthetic medicine. And they are the tear trough and the infraorbital furrow. They are two different grooves and it is important that you know them. If we focus more on the ocular region, what is inside the eyeball is important that you know or that you recall what is the pupil the iris, and the sclerocorneal limbus. The sclerocorneal limbus is the union of the pupil with the white region, which is the sclera. We have a medial sclerocorneal limbus and a lateral sclerocorneal limbus. In addition, we have an inner corner and an outer corner, one upper eyelid and one lower eyelid with eyelashes. In the area of the medial canthus, we have small tissue that we call caruncle. Remember that the lacrimal gland is located at the top and sides of the eye. 
And in the lower and medial area, we have the lacrimal sac with the nasolacrimal duct. The nasal region can also be divided into different sub-areas. It is important to know these names so that when we talk about different parts in aesthetic medicine, we know what we are talking about. The first portion is the glabella. The glabella is the most prominent point of the lower forehead area. In a profile position, it is the most prominent part of the forehead between the eyebrows. We can also say that it is almost the beginning of the nose. Next, mark number 18, we have the root of the nose, the nasal root or radix. This radix starts at the nasion. The nasion is the most depressed point that we have in the nose. If we look at it vertically from the side, it reaches more or less the height of a line drawn along the lower edge of both eyes. This is the root or radix. Next, we have the nasal dorsum. Inside the nasal dorsum, we have an anatomical structure called the renin, which is not indicated here. It refers to the union between the bony vault and the cartilaginous vault. I'll show you a picture later so that you can understand this. Following the dorsum, we have the tip, which you will often see it referred to as the nasal tip. On the sides of the tip, we have the nasal wings, with their edges and with their fold and delimiting both nasal wings are the nostrils. And in the center, the columella, also called the cartilaginous septum. It is important to remember what the anatomy of the nostrils and the nose is like. Seen from the outside, I'm going to see that the nose has a bony part formed by the nasal bones, and a cartilaginous portion formed by a series of complex nasal cartilage. But we are not going to go into more detail now because there is no need. If I look from below, I see the cartilages of the nasal wings and the septum. I'm looking at the cartilaginous portion. Just like the outside of the nose that has a bony part and a cartilaginous part, the same thing happens with the nasal septum. We have a bone part and a cartilaginous part. This is the sagittal plane cut. It passes right along the midline of the face. I mean, it goes right through what would be the nasal septum. And here we can see our nasal bone, our nasal cartilages, and all this is the septum. The septum has a bony portion which is formed by the perpendicular plane of the ethmoid and another bone portion that is formed by the vomer bone. And in the most frontal part, this cartilaginous septum is formed by the septal cartilage, which is what we see here, and it makes up our columella. Let's go with the oral region. It is important in the oral region to differentiate the white lip from the red lip, because it is thought that this is a lip and this is another. When we talk about surface anatomy and aesthetics, we talk about a white lip and a red lip. This is the white lip that is marked with number one. All this is our white upper lip and our white lower lip. And the red lip is really this. We have an upper lip and a bottom lip. Both lips meet at the corners. And, on the sides of the corners, we have a region called the modiolus. Right in the center of the upper white lip and below the columella, we have the little depression called the philtrum. Where the philtrum ends and the red upper lip begins, there is a kind of V-shape called Cupid's bow. Let's continue with the oracle. In the auricular pavilion, you probably know what is the lobe and the tragus. They are probably the two most known structures and easiest to recognize, whose names you have heard most. But you should also know the antitragus, right behind the tragus, and the entrance to the external auditory canal. 
It is essential that you know the helix, which is the most posterior point.